do you think that I showed them everything I know on the first tape? They're going to have to buy the second and the third and the fourth. Welcome to This Week in Morbs, everybody! The show of Mormanity! That was my intro, Jeff. That's what I had prepared. That was beautiful. It's better than this. It. This is this week in Mormons. Jeff is our co-host today. Al Hi. is our senior host. I would like an introduction, if you would. Please introduce me as your guest. Coming to us from the crappy suburbs of DC, living in a home with bars on the windows and cigarette smoking neighbors downstairs. One of those is true. Jeff Openshaw! It's, it's wonderful to be here, Al. Thank you for having me. That was pretty good. That, that, I feel like, that, was, I feel like that, was, that was my, my A game. That was beautiful. I love what you're doing. Thank you for that. Thank you. I would, can, can I get an intro? Do you have anything for me? Uh, live from hell. Aldo. Uh, isn't that? I think that's a Utah radio show already. Chunga Life. is on that one. <laughs> Live. Oh yeah, your radio. No, it's a radio <laughs> from hell, right? Isn't that a Utah thing? Yeah. yeah, Jeff, don't say those words. You know we're offending a lot of our user. Base. I'm talking about the place. I'm not using it as an exclamation. Doesn't matter. I'm just letting you know. We. Don't- I was homeschooled. I never said that word. You and I don't profane, Al. But we. I and I will. I shall never. I shall never. Are you eating Thin Mints or Tagalongs? What are those? Yeah, I'm eating thin mints, but I'm trying to get away from the microphone <laughs> so that I don't make noise. I was I've only got, this is my last one. Okay. That's why I, I had I had big plans for this episode. I was going to eat a delicious bowl of chocolate peanut butter ice cream while we were recording. I was so pumped up for this, and I, I I put it in the freezer this evening, and then I went back tonight to get some water, and the freezer was a jar because it didn't no. apparently popped back open. It had been that way for hours. I think my ice cream is just liquid. I was going to eat a juicy nectarine in front of you. I thought that would be nice. No, I'm sure the listeners would love that. Who doesn't love a juicy <laughs> nectarine? I'm so sorry. Uh, this, uh, this, a Thin Mint cookie is a terrible It idea. wasn't that the dream. The dream, though, is to be a large man in like medieval England who gets to sit there and eat nectarines and mutton and have the juices dripping down one's beard. And getting on one's robes. I think that is kind of the ideal that we're going That for. was the American dream? Not the American dream, actually. Many would call it the uh, the Tudor dream, perhaps. I don't know. You know, just some other <laughs> I'm dream. I'm living the Tudor dream. The Norman dream. I got dream. nectarine juice clogging up my beard. It's sticky and answer the there The Saxon for dream? I don't know. There's a lot of things we could go with here. I'm going to call it the Celtic dream. Because... I've got some mutton. Apparently, I needed some mutton with my yeah. nectarine. Yeah. You need some mutton. This so, so every time that guy was like, how you doing, man? He's like, just living the dream, bro. Just living the dream. Dude, when I, I haven't cleaned this beard in four months. Yes. When, living the dream. When I lived in Scotland and I'd go grocery shopping on a regular basis, I was often baffled by the offerings available in British grocery stores. You just, they've given us good things, but you just sit there and just, uh, you just don't understand. You're like, why? No, why, no. why is this what you're giving me? I just, Speaking of beards, I was Googling for beard softeners today i was looking i'm looking for maybe a beard softener everything that's out there is sandpaper jeff do you realize this our beard options because i'm i'm not growing it out so large that it like becomes naturally soft yeah this has been I, a pro- yeah my i yeah i've had this, there's a bit of a there's i've a had this problem with my wife yeah there's a bit of a prickle with the uh what you and i share of like a uh, i don't know maybe a four week beard a three three to five week beard i'm i'm more like yeah, i'm a four ish week beard four to five week beard yeah when i like i like to trim mine back but then there's there's a prickle there and so i was thinking maybe i could maybe there was like a an oil treatment or something and uh and that was my amazon adventure during my public affairs meeting tonight uh <laughs> i was i was investigating beard softening ways and the the leading treatment is sandpaper which all the amazon what? reviews are like don't get this my face was bloody after like just rub sandpaper mistake. of a fine like fine grain sandpaper yeah on beard. yeah it's like an emery board sort of thing that, the, that you get for it I, i'm a little shocked there should be better ways of softening beards i just think it's so weird that beard hair is so much coarser than head hair like it's some way genetically our, our head knows that the stuff on top can be soft and lovely but when it hits a certain point by your ears 
it comes it in, no. It comes in later, and it's rough, and it's dense, and it's scraggly. This and is I, the alpaca fur of the face. Yeah, it, it, it's weird, actually. Like, anything to keep the cold away. We're growing a shield. Hair on top, it knows. Maybe we want to flop to the left. Maybe it's going to flop to the right. No one knows. I'm with you. I'm excited that you had such a, a great time. We had Ward Conference over the weekend, and so I had to keep distractions to a minimum. Distractions of the mobile phone variety. I had to be on my best behavior because I am in... Is that right? Well, I am in, you know, I'm in the PEC, so you got to make sure you're... Got your A-game going on here. Got You get a lot of face what time with the state you, presidency. What happens if you don't have your A-game? Well, then you have a B game, and then they, they bench you. This was always my strategy. If they didn't like how I was doing my thing, what are they going to do? Release me and give me more time to be at home? I am often of the opinion that my first counselor is more fit to be the Elder Scorn president than I am. But, hey, whatever. I don't. Yeah, uh, don't be afraid of the coup, Jeff. Embrace the coup. I've told him. If he, if he has a coup, it will be a bloodless coup. I will just abdicate. I will step right down. <laughs> We, You're such a weak leader. You don't You're need. We won't need leader. some interim period of like a military junta or anything like that. He will. I will just step aside and say, "Oh, it's cool. It's cool. Do what you got to do." This will. You're like. Uh, you like President Medlev in Russia. This will be or Medved. <laughs> Medvedev. No, that's a, no. That would be like as if my first counselor was president, stepped down for one term so I could be president, and then will quickly and remove then said, me. And then said, while you are president, Jeff, I will remain the actual president, and everybody yes. will know. So right now, he, I am Medvedev, and he is my Putin prime minister, I guess you would say. That, yes. that sounds perfect. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with that analogy. All right. Speaking of Medved, Ukraine... Medved is, is honey bear in Russian. Did you know that? I did not know that. If it were honey badger, that would be all, it's just so awesome. Yeah. Oh. Does, oh, that'd be nice. Does Putin mean anything? I, I read his name and I want to think Putin. If Putin in Russian does translate to cheese curds and gravy, then oh I'm thrilled. Oh, my gosh. Thrilled. What a, between honey honey bears and – actually, now that I'm thinking about it, Med, Medved may just be bear. For some reason, I think it's honey bear. Medvedev. I don't know. Well, that's, that's neat. Regardless. So, Jeff, how was your week? How have you been? Uh, How are you? I've been fine. I, I want to I wanna think – word conference has always been an interesting thing to me. Go on. I've never yes, felt like yes, they're yes. very conference-y, like really. I mean, the, the only thing that sticks out is during sacrament meeting, the bishop will give a talk, which he doesn't you know, do very often, and the stake president will give remarks, and it's good and it's lovely. I don't know what they did during the second hour because we had a sort of stake leader sitting in on a ward council session, which was good. But I don't know if other wards are doing this, but uh, our, I've seen this a few times now in my stake. The third hour was an adult meeting and teenagers devoted to basically a Q&A. Now, I've attended Q&As before with apostles, which I feel like is a really cool opportunity to pick the brain of an anointed, you know, special witness of Christ. I feel like I sure. could, if I'm in a meeting with Elder Bednar and I want to say, like, I want to understand this piece of doctrine or something, explain it to me. Cool. When I feel like it's the stake presidency, it's not to detract from that, but I don't feel like there's a collective yearning as much from like the ward body to pick the brains of the stake presidency. They don't just want to know what's going on inside of there. Yeah, if anything, I want to ask questions about just like what's going on in the stake, like, hey, what's the progress on building that new meeting house we've talked about? Or, uh, you know, is there any work on the HVAC system down at the Mount Vernon building? What's our status on these things? I don't know. Everything in my mind is building related. So it was, a, it was a blank question and answer. Yeah, well, they let off with some remarks, and they've done this before, and some people had, uh, I think, perfectly good questions. A, a big concern in our region is that uh, there's not a lot of youth. You have a lot of young couples who can live here when we're young and don't have the burdens of lots of kids, but then they all move away when their families grow because they can't afford to live here anymore, and so as a result, you have the handful of families that are permanent and very, very few youth. And that's a problem at our stake where I think a lot of families want their youth to have greater experiences, like communing with other LDS youth because they just don't have it's not like living out west or anything where you might go to high school even in like California which has Mormons but it's not crazily Mormon but I was in high school and there would be like you know 20 of us who were Mormon at least and I knew everybody here sure. you'll be the only yes here you'll be the only Mormon in your high school basically that's hard okay that's hard for the kids and that's uh, a fun story yeah, the response was interesting. Our stake presidents lived abroad a lot, and I think his response was basically trying to say, have perspective. Most of the church is not like the Western United States. Most of the church is like it is here, where you've got a handful of youth, and they just have to tough it out and <laughs> kind of make the most of what they've got. That was fun. So, Yeah, I believe that. Anyway, so as far as ward conferences, I don't know if I'm sold on their utility, but I was okay with it. 
it got me out of having to do anything for the third hour for elders quorum. So that's good. I like him. I like him from a perspective of, uh, of you as a leader, getting a little bit of training, being able to focus on, on you for a bit. And that's the part I liked because in the second hour, we did that that sort of ward council with the stake presidency, and that I thought was very useful. I enjoyed that a lot. Getting you know, it'd be great. What if they time. came and had a sacrament meeting? Everybody else went home, and then you just worked with the leaders for the rest of the afternoon. I'd be down with that, and I actually like sitting in meetings where I'm learning how to be effective in my you calling. Would. With no, here's the thing: I don't like meetings in general, but when you have the opportunity to be with your stake presidency and other stake leaders. The dynamic. Yeah, it's a chance for you to get lifted. I feel. Like. Yeah, exactly. The dynamic changes, and I, there's stuff I can learn from. It's not that I don't learn from my ward members, but it's you know it's throwing another element into the mix. And I I know what you. I mean. enjoyed that, and uh, so that happened, and the rest of my life uh, is boring. Is boring. No, Jeff, your life is great. Uh, my life is great. It doesn't mean that uh, having a chill life right now is bad. My life no, is yeah. good. I was going. Absolutely. I was going to go to a nacho party on sunday but we we passed <laughs> at the end of the day we passed this just in people jeff was on his way to a nacho party we didn't go it didn't well <laughs> wait for it i haven't finished he didn't go it didn't happen it didn't happen so that's all <laughs> it was too much excitement for one night they wanted to space it sorry i'll please play your trump card tell me about all that you've been doing cosmo jeff i didn't do anything you know i didn't do anything this week Ma no that's not true i was in ventura uh, for a while, that was great. Um, flew home back in Kansas City. I'm off this week. I fly out tomorrow. I'm off to Hawaii. I'm really, my life is amazing. Like, the more you make me talk about it, the more stoked I am on on my life as opposed to yours. Uh, and, and I'm not just saying that to be mean. I'm saying Why that do you say that anything other than, than to be mean? That's like your entire MO. <laughs> Come on. No, I got a buddy getting married out there. He, he's been dating this girl for, uh, for a little while, and they... They uh, they were talking about getting married, and it was one of those. It's usually, how it and you don't see this yeah. in the Mormon world very much. But they were just like, they're like, who do you really want at your wedding? Like, I got four buddies that I'd really love to see, and then I just want to send a, I want to have a reception with everyone else. And she's like, yeah, me too. And he's like, great, let's just go to Hawaii and do it. So they went to, Ho they're flying to Hawaii, getting married, uh, getting married over Valentine's Day. So I'm very excited. That's another excuse. That's Ted's Bakery Pie, the chocolate haupia pie. I'm getting some more Mitsukan uh, garlic chicken. I'm getting a little bit of uh, uh -huh. the Papa Ole's plate lunch. Sure. Like, everything's sure. all set. I'm ready to go. This sounds... I cannot wait. This sounds wonderful. And delightful. here's the here's a pro tip. I may have shared this before. From Kansas City to Vegas, like a $39 flight on Spirit Air. Crappy, fly, crappy airline. Like, one of the worst. But if you pay the 20 bucks to upgrade, you get a great seat up front. And just pack your own water. Be ready to not be served anything. And then you get to Vegas, though, for like 40, 50 bucks. And then out of Vegas, it's Allegiant Air, another very crappy airline, for like 300-some bucks round trip to Hawaii. It's genius. Jeff, I'm flying out, out of Hawaii like under $400. It's a treat. I am I'm thrilled for you. You can also scour popular websites like The Flight Deal, which find you know big things that are going on. I use that sometimes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I found a round trip to Moscow for 300 bucks on Delta. It was amazing. No way. Yeah. And you could fly into Moscow out of St. Petersburg. No uh, change in fees. Oh, my God. I was going to call. Let's I was go. What is that? Oh, the, it's already gone. Why would that deal still be there? Come on. We could go. Oh, yeah, that's true. It would be. Anyway. It would be fun. I mean, it would be. Right now, I could fly from D.C. to Portland for 270 bucks. So, so uh, some Going of the big, some of the big news, Jeff. Like, I kind of want to jump right into the to the John Deloitte hit. thing. Who's going to hit me? Are you going to hit me? Hit me. Hit me. Okay. Which reminds me, Pittsburgh. How are you sleeping? Do you want to talk about him being excommunicated or his fin the finances he receives, <clears throat> or we can talk about all of it? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Let's <clears throat> let's go let's go through all of it. But uh, but to start, let's talk about him being excommunicated. So that happened last night, right? Yeah, well, he got the letter. John received the letter yesterday. Some leaks came out. He clearly shared it with his close associates, but it sort of leaked this morning through some news outlets. But then he went on good old Radio West with Doug Fabrizio. To, Wait, so when, to, when would that have happened? They wouldn't have held. They wouldn't have held a uh, uh, disciplinary council on Monday. It would have been Sunday it was, night. It was on Sunday night. I actually actually got. I watched the live. Uh, feed that somebody had put up where nothing's happening you're watching footage of a bunch of people just standing with candles with nothing going on but then an official you missed the nacho party for that 
Well, it was very late at night. I mean, this was this was <laughs> this was around you know eleven thirty or midnight or something. Uh, eventually, a I assume regional, maybe state public affairs guy came out and just announced they've talked, but they want to stew on it a little bit. So no firm decision tonight. Then John Dolan came out, still read his previously prepared remarks, which were all the usual. This struggle will go forward. History stands alone without the sands of time. Really, they didn't. They didn't give a, uh, a decision that night. No, no decision that night. They said they would wait, um, and so that obviously came to John by whatever form, email or the or I love this. The the many in the blogger knackle, or in the the hubites as they call them in the Mormon hub, were mocking the very fact that they said they were going to mail the letter by traditional post. Like, oh yeah, let's make fun of his stick president. For mailing the letter to him instead of an email, personally, because I will send this, I will send this to you by a letter written only by natural light. Personally, if I, I would at least want, I feel like it's more official if I get a letter than getting an email from someone. I think I'd prefer yeah, a letter definitely. than a, to an email. So I, when bl- dealing with things of eternal worth, send it via certified mail. Yeah. So uh, or Telegram, I'll accept Telegram, but. Um, uh, so I believe John received it on, uh, Monday the 9th. I think it was just the next day at some point, but then he decided to have, I couldn't, this made me think of like LeBron James. Remember LeBron, the decision. This was like that where John said he was going to reveal the contents of the letter on the air on radio West and all issues with the whole thing aside. I'm just thinking like, really? This is what we're going to do with something involving... He's the Sean Hannity of the Mormon world. He's a great entertainer. <laughs> your ex... Yeah. Like, this is what you're going to do with something as, now, as serious... Now, here's the thing. So, I had, some people in, I had some people in my network that, uh, that you know, are not LDS, but were very staunch supporters of the... I mean, sure. uh, very, very active in the... I stand with John DeLynn. I stand with him. Um, and I, I would... I would like I was curious about some of those, so I just asked them, like, "What, what is it that you're standing with?" And they say, "Well, his his views on sort of hot topic Mormon things, and uh, and then like I just want him to know that he's got that he's got supporters. I want him to know that he's not alone in this." And I was like, "I was like, the crazy thing about that is that all of all of Mormondom should be standing with John DeLynn as." his support network right <clears throat> like like i don't i don't think that there I, and unfortunately there are people that are legitimately against him just because we have some bigots inside the church as well as out um but like the the idea is that we are all his brothers and sisters and we are we like no one wants him to hurt they want him to have clarity of mind and to feel like he has resolved uh the th- his his doubts and uncertainty and all that stuff and that he has sure footing uh, from a religious standpoint. Like, that is that is the hope that I think all of us have for him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like, with, with uh, like, a lot of us standing on the sidelines with that sort of innate desire, he's out there uh, making a spectacle of, of the whole ordeal, which is difficult to watch as ones that, like, from a gospel perspective, want him to... Uh, like find happiness and success. Yeah, I agree, and that's what's frustrating for me. I mean, it's funny because I, I think John Dolan has has portrayed himself as something of a victim. He's told people, you know, don't leave the church because of me or anything like that. I'm not a martyr, but he's kind of made himself into a martyr. But I like that he's he feels like the media has twisted stuff and distorted what things and made it a little bit different than he wants it to be. And he says he doesn't want that attention, but at the same time. Like, dude, you're the one who's, like, been going to the media in the first place. I mean, I know that some things are always out of our control, but John DeLynn, if you don't want the media to cover this stuff and want it to be a private affair, then that don't go to then, the then that is on you, dude. It's not on anybody else. And you can say initially that a stake president said he was going to go public because of John being a public person or this or that. But even that account, from what we know, and we only know it from John's side because his stake president's not going to publish anything um, – well, you know, we only know what we know from what John has said happened. So, so but ultimately, the letter the letter came out and said uh, said you know just told him that he was excommunicated, right? <laughs> and <laughs> yes, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Yes, it said that. 
Uh, yeah, so it says that, then, and then John DeLynn uh, sort of puts his spin on it, and he he keeps making these assertions that, uh, or these assertions that, that it was because of his stance on gay marriage. Is that accurate, Jeff? Well, the way it, it gets a little complicated here, and for some backstory, so what we've learned is that John DeLynn actually obviously secretly recorded one of his meetings with the stake president some time ago and then transcribed it. He did not release... Or maybe, maybe not secretly. He may have talked to him. I, no, 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 because the stake president is in the transcription saying stuff like, there's a reason I don't want these meetings recorded because I don't want things like what we talk about here to go on the public record. So I would assume that John was doing it surreptitiously because, you know, for the greater good or whatever. But... Uh, so what we learned from that, based on the account here that is only coming from John DeLynn, um, that the stake president basically said things like he wasn't comfortable with him supporting gay marriage. And it kind of comes out of nowhere because John comes out of nowhere and just says, so uh, is it a problem if I support same-sex marriage? Totally non sequitur based on what they're talking about. Stake president stresses, that's something you can do. That's okay. You can be a member of good standing. But that it's a problem if you're recruiting a group is sort of what's said and john's leaned on that which is what we what we've like speculated on for for a while i mean as we've as we've had discussions our own discussions um around this like that's sort of where we've landed is is you can like no one's saying that you need to agree with the church or that you can't be a thinker or that you can't publish your thoughts uh and talk about uh talk about maybe some opposing views the the trouble comes in trying to recruit people to a view that is opposing Doctrine sure, sure, sure. But but here's the th- well, there's a whole other thing. We believe, of course, that doctrinally the homosexuality is wrong, but I don't know if we have, like, if it's the same to say doctrine as far as gay marriage goes. Well, maybe I'm a little bit off on that one. I don't know. You know what I mean? Slight slight difference there. Like, the scriptures don't discuss marriage between gay people. But sure. but sure. Uh, but I'm, I welcome anyone's comments on that. I'm not saying I'm dead on on that one. Um, but it's I could also see a, a little bit of a slippery slope there and I'm just curious about this because it's one thing if to organize groups or whatever right but like we recently learned from some of the remarks from elders Christofferson and Oaks of course we can vote against things the church suggests and there's no consequence for that but me organizing via a podcast or whatever my personal views on something and pushing for that uh, what's the difference between that and say if I can play devil's advocate and say being against, being for gay marriage, and rallying with people, and because that's part of my exercise in democracy. Is that not also sort of, you know, joining together in that same mentality, in a, in a sense? You follow what I'm saying there? I'm not saying I agree. Sure. With, I agree with it, but I, I struggle. Yeah, I, I, well, I, well, absolutely, and and I think from a uh, from a political activism standpoint, sure. If the purpose is to is to vote in a democratic way on something, I think I think you're probably safe. If the purpose is to uh, oppose the church, uh-huh. even like if there's a if there's a political decision to be made, that's I think that's different, right? Okay, um, and I think so. I think what you're is saying is just yeah to detract from the uh, from the followers of the church. And I think that's a fair distinction. That's a good way to put it. And I know I'm I'm just kind of fleshing this out as I think about it. So that's yeah yeah that's a good way to look at it. But what we do learn here. The key thing is, and the letter delivered to Mr. Dillon, and the church actually responded to this. Now, maybe they learned from the Kit Kelly stuff, but they actually decided to correct the public record and comment on John Dillon's next communication, which is different because, of course, we didn't get any of that with the Kit Kelly stuff. Um, but the three reasons why that are cited for the excommunication, so I say this is important because this doesn't matter what might have been discussed in a meeting that was secretly secretly recorded or a back and forth here and there. Obviously, these are the things that are being brought up specifically in letter format by a stake president. So it's disputing the nature of Heavenly Father and the divinity of Jesus Christ, statements that the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham are false and works of fiction, and statements that reject the authority of the church, and that the church is true and has power, the power of God. That's all it lists is the three reasons why he was excommunicated for apostasy. And if you distill it down to those three reasons, I think it's unfortunate, but I also get it more and more because it's yeah. So he was he was excommunicated for apostasy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was the that was the overarching one, and so he comes out and sort of puts his his little bit of spin on it. And this is very very rare, but the church responds. Um, they said that they have the responsibility to correct the public record. 
And uh, then they came out and issued a letter and said essentially, like, we have every expectation that the local leaders uh, operated under the proper general uh, principles and guidelines of the church. Um, these councils are always for better when all involved respect the principles of confidentiality. At the very least, this principle helps those members who wish to return to full fellowship at a later date. Uh, when the member has chosen to air their grievances in public, the church reserves the right to correct the public record. In this case, attempts have been made to create the impression that the disciplinary council convened on Sunday, February 8th, uh, and which has resulted in a loss of church membership or excommunication of Mr. DeLynn, arose largely because of his views on same-sex marriage and with uh, or, and priest ordination for women. Although his, stand position, or his stated positions on those subjects are not consistent with the church's teachings, they were not cited in the local leader's letter delivered to Mr. DeLynn on February 9th, which spelled out the reasons for the local council's unanimous decision as follows. Disputing what you just said, Jeff, disputing the nature of Heavenly Father, statements on that the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham are frauds, yeah. uh, and statements and teaching that reject the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a true church. Or as the two church. Uh, so they, they sort of, I mean, this is, I've never seen anything like this in my time. Somebody, like before me, maybe they've, they've done this. But uh, this is actually really uh, nice for me to see that that they're willing to come out and say, hold on, we're not just going to get slugged through the mud here. That let's, like, just so you know, people remember, this is what's going on. Because a lot of the memes going around supporting John DeLynn are, uh, you know, like, like they have these weird sort of this weird context of like of like if you want to be able to think in the Mormon church, you've got to stand with John DeLynn. Yeah. We stand together. And I don't I don't think that's true. I don't get the I don't get the feeling that I'm that I'm being censored or that there's any um any part of uh, of what we do that we have to tiptoe around stuff because we uh I I mean as members of the church, our intent is is Ultimately, pro-church. If we have questions, we have questions seeking honest answers, uh, not seeking to detract. Right? Yeah, totally. And that's a, now what's that's such a key oh, thing. Ahead. Oh no, just that it's a key thing, and it has kind of cracked me up because I, I don't I understand how we create a narrative saying that this is somehow a an attack on uh, freedoms of expression within the church and the ability to express one's views publicly, but uh, it's not entirely about that but i i do understand at least frustration from people who don't still don't feel like the delineation is very clear you know and in, and in the we'll link to it if you care about it but in the uh since john Dillon has published this transcript of his old meeting from last august with the stake president if it's all accurate you actually see a lot of kind of circular discussion about back and forth where he's saying like well i want to understand where this line is you're saying i can't discuss things publicly but you're also saying i can question things and so i'm and I, I think there is confusion about that, but I think it's a li- but I think it is a little bit different when you're someone of influence. You know, I, I, I who cares if you're in a meeting and you want to talk about stuff, but if you are in a position where I think it's perceived that you have people who are followers, and from what I saw, even watching that rally on Sunday, I mean, you're seeing people who are just straight up just followers in a sense. We'll just do whatever John tells them to do. Um, that that is where it gets a little bit more dangerous. And where sometimes, unfortunately, uh, actions like that, like what we've seen, are the the only avenue that can be taken. Because uh, one's like, like that article that Kurt Frankham of Leading LDS published on our, our website a few weeks ago. You know, he talks about disciplinary councils, his experience with them as a bishop, and how he says this isn't about like what you've done wrong as much as it's about your willingness to correct your behavior. And, and change. And it's not like the church trying to prove itself saying we're right. The church is right. Get in line. But like none of us are perfect. And you have to demonstrate a modicum of contrition in any situation. Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting. Pride uh, ends up being, well, we saw it. We saw it both with Kate Kelly and here. Uh, but in general, I feel like that's, that's one of the big things that keeps people from having uh, any kind of meaningful repentance process. Right when the yeah. when the when the intent going in is to prove why you're right, and they have no base for telling you that you're wrong, uh, typically that's not going to end well. And and what's interesting about that is if you go in with with uh, sort of a a open mind of like 
talk to me about about how maybe I like how am I doing harm? How, like what do I need to do differently? How could I do better? Uh, if you had an open mind in that regard, you can like I I can't think of a single thing that John DeLynn was uh, is battling internally or anything like that that would have resulted in excommunication. Uh, but the but you know the banner of open mindedness that he's running with does not apply to him being open minded with the church. It applies only to the church needing to be open minded with him. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it is a two way street, and I feel like that's the standard I'm I'm seeing from a lot of people who are under under going through this process. It's yeah, you you want the church to be pliable, to be open minded, to be patient with you. But I don't see a lot of patience coming the other way towards the church. And you know, what's uh, what's crazy about this too is ways. having so so in my in my uh, calling now I've sat through a few disciplinary councils as well. And and that's an eye opener. The yeah. the thing that surprises me the most about these is the sort of overwhelming feeling of love, and uh, and just genuine sadness, um, sadness for the person going through uh, this painful experience for what uh you know what maybe uh, any kind of church discipline might mean for them uh i like i'm i was genuinely just blown away at the uh at the just i mean i mean the, you're there you're there and you're listening to this story i mean it's it's essentially you're you're letting them letting them go through this process with you and then you're trying to decide uh, you know, if somebody comes in and they are they are incredibly humble and willing to change and ready to do anything, you know, you're you're like you're trying to meet out a uh, a sort of sort of a, a a road that they need to walk back through that's going to get them back to full standing in the church the fastest. And excommunication is typical, like in my experience, has been uh, it's been doled out when when a lot of times when the people don't think that they've done anything wrong yeah and uh and you know but like but like again you just have this incredible sadness that that sort of permeates that and it's this it's sadness that comes from love right and so like i can't imagine sitting in john delin's council there or where they were having their discussion and feeling those feelings of sadness and and love for him uh, and disappointment in in maybe some of the roads that he's taken but like this optimism or hope i mean you you no one no one wants you to have to be excommunicated that's never the intent right you, like like you battle to try and give them every possible alternative to that um and to have like knowing knowing what those brethren must have been going through, and then to see sort of John's what seems to be a flippant reaction as he walks out is just like, all right, where's the New York Times again? Let's get this show on the road. Uh, it, I mean, really, just feels uh, a little bit sleazy to me. Yeah, I agree. It's uh... it's 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 a crummy situation all around, and I. Like I feel for uh, well, one you feel for John DeLynn, you feel for him having to go through all this. The other you feel for the brethren that had to sit on that council and make that decision, knowing full well that they were going to be made a spectacle, and uh, and that they were trying to stay focused on making the right decision for this man's salvation. That's a hard. That's a hard ask out of those guys. I know. I would. I would hate to be in that position. I mean, that's just yeah. It's brutal, and I think one of the hard, other hard things is it's very easy to see this as the church coming down on people, but don't forget that, of course, there's nothing wrong if you're in a situation to feel that you have a, also a place to defend yourself, to clarify your position or what's going on. You know, this isn't sp supposed to be something where you show up and get just a beat down and allegations thrown at you the whole time. I mean, it's it's called a council for a reason. You are supposed to be able to defend yourself if you have witnesses, all sorts of things. And I, I trust that, you know, John DeLynn was confident in his, that he, nothing he was doing uh, was wrong. But I felt like so much of it has been a challenge to the church, basically saying like, you know, whatever, this is what I believe. And, you know, I, I'm just going to kind of, it, it seems almost flippant, even though he's very well-spoken, very soft-spoken. And uh, it's it's disappointing to me to see how much he constantly uh, milks the media. I mean, he was on MSNBC this week. Why he had to read his letter on 
Radio West? I mean, like, like why? Just send a little note about it. Let it be a private affair. Instead, it's almost like any chance he has to drum up more publicity for what he's doing and is, is what he wants to do. And personally, I think yeah. that's unfortunate because I don't think that's the point of any of it, right? Like, is your point to actually work on your relationship with the church and to hopefully, if your mandate is to utilize Mormon stories or something like that, as a vehicle to keep people into church, to, to let it be a safe place for people to have questions and talk about difficult things with an objective of keeping people in the church, well, then visit your methodology and see if what you are actually doing supports that mission. And I know his mission has changed, and now he wants to support people who leave the church, too. But I just feel like so much of it is just instead finding criticisms of the church and then sort of all patting each other on the back with how much smarter we are than the dopey stake yeah. president. And that's that's an unfortunate thing. And I'm not saying John's a bad guy or anything. I think John's clearly a very nice, considerate man. But uh, that's just sad. It's just sad because, yeah. I mean, you see him. I don't think he'll even appeal. You know, Kate Kelly tried to appeal, and it's just – uh, I know he's done some good things, and a lot of people I know have benefited from the work of John DeLynn, but I also think it's very difficult to substantiate your place as a member in good standing when you stand up there and just say that you don't think President Monson speaks for God because he's right. senile or he's got dementia or whatever else, and be like, well, you're not the one in that position. You're not in the inner workings of stuff, and you're trying to convince and rally people around this this way of thinking, so... It's tough. I, anyway, do we want to do, do we want to spend any time on his salary um, before we move on? Well, I don't mind this. This broke this broke a little bit uh, earlier last week or so. Peggy Fletcher Stack. It's funny the reaction people uh, had to this. The headline. I didn't think the headline was anything that provocative in reading it at all. But I saw a lot of people take issue that it just says Mormon facing excommunication makes his living off of his podcasts which I thought was just a matter-of-fact statement. If anything, I thought it was supportive. I read this and thought it read like a pretty biased article from Peggy Fletcher Stack, obviously supporting John DeLynn. I mean, honestly, it read like to, I said it read like a press release. But it goes through his finances, and he uh, John received ninety grand in 2013, not last year. After taxes and insurance and stuff, he made between sixty and seventy thousand dollars which, of course, the guy's not rolling in dough or anything like that. I know he's he gave up more lucrative jobs with Microsoft. He went to MIT. So this is his passion project, and that's fine. I'm not going to knock a guy for it. It's just easy to see, like, that he... I I can't, like, ever shake the feeling that he's always utilizing every media opportunity to keep milking his brand and get people sure, to donate. Sure. You know, and it's hard, it's hard for me to shake that feeling. I want to think that's not true, and he's just so passionate about his message that he jumps in on it every chance he can get. But he even said that his donations have quintupled or so since everything started going down last summer. And so it's like, well, good for you, John DeLynn. I mean, anybody in a nonprofit is, you're entitled to your your uh, compensation for that. No, no one said running a nonprofit means you don't get any money for it. And that's not the end of the world. Though I uh, I did think a lot of people are, were kind of running with it, saying how, how magnanimous John is for releasing his finances. And I'm like, dude, it's a nonprofit. He legally has to disclose all the finances of the institution. It's not – maybe he would – maybe if it was a little for-profit company he had, he'd do it to be nice. But we don't know that. We don't know if he'd do that or not. He might just keep it all private in that sense. But le all I know is legally he has to tell us what he's making. And, the, well, and, well, and, and to be completely fair, it doesn't bother – it shouldn't bother anybody – that uh, that he he does get donations. I mean, who cares? No, I mean it's fine. I mean it is funny. It's harder though. Cause, it's interesting. Cause he makes it's interesting to see that, that there's a living to be made uh, doing what he does. <laughs> yeah, but. makes you think twice about what we're doing, right, Al? Time to start milking it. <laughs> we're out like thirty bucks already, folks. Anyway, we've spent a lot of time on how old, much on old John, will you but, pay uh, to listen to this podcast? That is my question. Can I get ten dollars? Can I get ten dollars? Ten dollars? Ten dollars from you, sir? Yep. You, sir. Yep. Please, yep, nope. nope. All of you nope. send us your funds or we will stop making this. That's not true. That's and not we true. Will, I'm just planning on quitting making this is like if I ever get married. And we That's the goal. Uh, then I will keep praying for your uh, singledom. That'll be Your it. faith is very strong, Jeff. I feel like you've lobbied that very <laughs> successfully up till now. Uh, let's see. There's some <laughs> other there's up. some other stuff. My favorite uh, out of the week is there's an article on tech.lds.org. They put out a little a little part two, a little follow up to how to improve internet access in meeting houses. Yes, uh, this got posted to our Facebook wall by a listener, and it makes me smile because so I'm over our facilities management in in the stake, 
And uh, we've had several of the people mail in with uh, questions about speed and how to get better internet. And here, here's a little article written that's, that teaches us how to get better internet. And it says, Tell me. Don't use the internet. Oh, well, that makes and sense. And the internet will be fast. That makes sense. It makes. They say, download all the stuff you need to download at home. And then when you come to use the internet, it'll be, it'll be fast. Uh, sort of... Just a really, I mean, it's just a really stupid. Basically, article, it's, but it's good it, for. It's tug, go ahead. It's tongue in cheek for us because we're like legitimately trying to fix this in a lot of buildings <laughs> and stuff, and uh, they're like, no, 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 we solved it for you. Don't need the internet, and it'll be fast. No, you know what they yeah. need to do is they need to unblock YouTube. YouTube is blocked in meeting houses. Good. I don't think it, Jeff. Jeff, you have slow internet already. Okay, I get it if they're blocking it because they think, yeah, they can't stream a video, but I think they do it for other reasons. Because, like, BYU used to block YouTube just on principle. No, it's speed. It might In be. In the meeting houses, it's speed. Well, why, why is it so hard to get good speed? Yeah, you've got a, a congregation showing up that's going to use up a lot of the bandwidth, but at, at any one time, I mean... if the best, internet, the best internet we've got out here is 10 megabit DSL. You put 100 people on that with their smartphones... It's over. You're hurting just getting email. Yeah. It's over. The answer is to not, like we talked about, don't use the internet, and then it'll be fast for me. Which I can, I can, you know, respect. I just, I, I love the advice of like, no, you can't stream the video. You need to download it at home. That's yeah, just true. Like, yep. Which I've always yep. done. I learned a long time ago. You can't rely on the church Wi-Fi to stream a video. But I think we should live in a world where maybe you can rely on the Wi-Fi to stream a video because. We might be close. We might be close. Look at, look at it this way. You never know. How often you would maybe need to stream a video? In your average ward, if you are in gospel doctrine, you might have two classes in your ward. So if both teachers wanted to stream videos, that's only two people streaming at once. Maybe in Yeah, but then you need everybody in the, in the audience to not be streaming their own version of the video. Because you know what I'm doing, Jeff? I'm watching news radio clips while you're streaming. Well, that's that your video. fault. You shouldn't be streaming. If you're just tootling around on Facebook. But I am it. streaming, and that's the reality of it You all. stream stuff while you're sitting in church? Yeah, I keep one headphone in. I have a Bluetooth earbud. Uh-huh. And I just like to watch, uh, you know, funny news radio episodes. That's good. I read, I read the scriptures, but teach their own. Yeah. What we've learned no, here today is oh, yeah. the church Wi-Fi is basically good for nothing more than updating your LDS tools app. That's when you need to sync that's it, about it. That's why it exists. Um, in other church uh, institutional news, the church is getting rid of pensions and moving to a dun, 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 retirement savings account. So if previously you've been, you know, working with consecrated funds and not getting a lot of money working for the church, but you enjoyed the fact that you would receive a pension at no cost to you upon retirement. No. That will be gone, and now you'll have to roll the dice with mutual funds. Congratulations! You have three weeks to to figure that out. And, Good luck, everybody. And uh, I don't know. I don't. I I think there are mixed feelings about this from different corners. I well, I'm sure now you have to save money in order to retire instead of just getting a pension from your company. Pensions were cool, man. I don't know. Saving money. I wonder what they'll do as far as matching goes. I'll be curious to find details out about this. If the church does no matching, oh, it does one say, to one up to six percent. That's made up. But that's not real. They do say employer match. Well, I think the federal limit's seven percent, right? Isn't that isn't that the legal limit so. for employer matching? Otherwise, everybody would start their own business and just match their own. That's what I would do right now. This twin will match my four hundred one k. I like it. So uh, down in New Zealand, take me there. Je did you did you hear about this? Of course you did. Down in New Zealand, there were two missionaries that got attacked. Well, one of them was a Tongan, and there were some other Tongans nearby that saw them getting attacked, and so they ran and beat up the attackers. Two missionaries were taken to the hospital. They're fine. The attackers were uh, were a little bit worse off, which just goes to show: do not beat up missionaries. Do not beat up Elder Mahi and Elder Lao. Especially if you're drunk. Likewise, I wish Thank they would. I wish they would have beat up Elder Gabriel Guerrero, who posted a selfie of himself every day for two years, made it into a video. It's a fun video to watch. I only want. No, he said. He said, you know, I saw a lot of selfie videos, but not a lot of missionaries. So yeah. you know what I was said I was gonna do? Missionary selfie. I only would have liked him to get beat up just so we'd see a few glimpses of him with a like a bruised <laughs> face and then really you slowly funny. watch it fade away i just want to see like happy smiling 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 straight face big huge blue just, eye just to see that that's slowly all the swelling goes down the smile starts to come back 
But uh, anyway, it's fine. It's just a video of... It, uh, he seems to be in his apartment most of the time. Which is good, and it's soundtrack to the best two years, which of course is the third or fourth best missionary themed movie it is excellent just excellent i don't know he's in one apartment with stainless steel fridge i don't know what's up with that because missions are an exercise in austerity people you don't have a fancy kitchen as a missionary unless it's a furnished apartment quit your wine well they're all furnished that's how they come when you're a mission i don't know what it's like to serve stateside so, <clears throat> don't ask me so here's here's an interesting article uh on it's it's let's see what was her name better find it the uh katrina lantos svet she's in the news this week because she and six other human rights activists have volunteered to take 100 lashes each of the 1000 lash punishment uh that saudi arabia is meeting out to a blogger accused of heresy against islam so essentially the uh you know the i'll take it i'll take your lashings for you big tom uh sort of story that Gordon B. Hinckley loved to share is being played out in real life uh, times a thousand. First, pretty uh, incredible that a thousand lashings is a punishment that can be court-ordered in 2015. Saudi Arabia, dude. On this earth. Um, And second, second, like, it's pretty darn courageous uh, of this of this woman to go and, and volunteer that. I, I wonder if they will let her, but I don't know. I doubt Jana it. Jana Reese, Jana Reese has a, has a great little piece on it. I mean, it really like, it's weird to me to see any stuff like this in the news, just because in my head, this could never, ever happen. It's, it's, it's not a real thing. No one get, no woman is going to get lashed for disrespecting Islam. That's asinine. But they will in Saudi Arabia because it's, Wah- it's Wahhabism. It's it's a whole, whole special thing out there. <clears throat> but the guy who's getting lashed is actually a man who was a Saudi blogger. And he, he's only received 50 of his lashes so far. So he's 5% of the way through his sentence of 1,000. So, every so the Friday. next time you think that we don't have religious freedom in America, everybody, just want you to take a deep breath and remember how it is everywhere else. Our, some of our struggles... While important, are also this woman has seven children. Very small. Well, she's also a convert. Yeah, she was raised Jewish. Joined the church later on. Crazy. Anyway, if you also want uh, another thing in sort of U.S. politics, Washington Post. Good old Hunter Schwartz, man. He's moved over to the the Wapo. Hunter Schwartz was on BuzzFeed. He's he interviewed me for an article a year and a half ago or so for BuzzFeed. Oh yeah, I remember when you were famous. Uh, it happened once for a day. Um, anyway, it's kind of a cool thing. They mapped out just the religious affiliations of the members of the current U.S. Congress. So if you're into looking at maps and just seeing who's what, where, and they, the map is by... If you are in the 1.5% that is Jeff Openshaw. Yep, yep. I am the 1.5%. Absolutely. Um, it shows it by congressional district. Those are the boundaries. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just kind of cool. And then it's got a list at the end. You can see all the specific details. Filter it by, you know, religion, district, name, whatever it might be. But it's kind of fun. And you, I never realized that, of course, Utah and Idaho are both 100% Mormon in their congressional seats, which I did not. Absolutely. I did not know that. I thought Idaho might be half and half or something like that. In other big news, there is a pipe in Reno. I wasn't done, but okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, it's over now. A good point to be made here. We gripe about Mormons being predominantly republican but also bear in mind jews our friends of the jewish faith are predominantly democrat by a a more significant percentage according to pew than mormons are republican so we're not the only Uh ones that kind of have a very lopsided political affiliation which is right why rudy giuliani felt so confident about florida of course all the old people and the jews all the old jewish people tell me more about reno yes you were saying for those of us not interested in maps or Congress, uh, th- two of the best <laughs> there, things on earth. You just said there's just a, there was a, po- a water pipe at uh, at a Reno church uh, that uh, that got clogged. <laughs> there was a flood in the parking lot. Stupidest article, <laughs> Jeff. I I kind of like that we're th- that we're throwing back to some of the old trash articles that are just like, man walked across church parking lot. Oh, this is serious. This is serious. Three feet of water in Reno. Yeah, they were just excited to see water. They thought it was a lake. The kids came out and 
put a boat in. Make the it was nice. make the um the upside is there is no comment on this Fox 11 article. Uh, we encourage all of you, our listeners, to go and comment. They use Discuss as their commenting engine, so just go hop on there and rock out, everybody. One, uh, one other quick one. We got an email from uh, from one of our listeners that tipped us off to a a movie called the uh, the Spirit of the Game, and apparently this was a thing back in the back in the fifties. Uh, they would have like a team of missionaries that would play basketball and go around. And uh, and play throughout Australia. They were they were just like a an exhibition game group, and so you have a bunch of a bunch of white American kids that would go around and play basketball. It was, I would have loved that mission. I would have been such a great missionary if my job was to shoot my silky smooth three pointer like a big six foot seven Sam Perkins from the Indiana Pacers that I am. That's what I should have been doing. It sounds delightful. What? What is that behind? It, it actually you? sounds like a like a really good movie. I'd love to see. Well, it's going to be Hoosiers, but more. But is it a do- is it a document? Long away. Is it a documentary or is it just a a drama, like a feature length? I think it's just a drama. Okay. It's going to be written by Darren Scott. Is that supposed to mean something to me? Wait, no. Uh, who's the guy that did uh, God's Army? You're That's thinking of Richard guy. G. He's an apostle. Yes. That would have been great too. No, no, no. You're thinking of the God's Army guy is uh, Richard Dutcher. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Richard has All since right, moved on. Mind. He's moved on. Never mind. I definitely Richard. thought it was God's Army. No, it's not God's Army, but I think this might be more entertaining. It's Church Ball, but in Australia, mate. <laughs> They're gonna have Gary Coleman as one of the opponents. Al oh, Gary Coleman yeah. died post mortem. Okay, Jeff. He's gonna come back. They can use a hologram or just make him CGI. Yeah. Uh, another great news, everybody. Elder Oaks did a fireside over the weekend at the uh, University of Utah Institute, which is ironic in and of itself because we all know people who go there have no no testimony. But whatever, <laughs> why I'm, you know silly audience to play to. But um, he did a whole fireside, basically about uh, his oft repeated message about hanging out and to, uh, as he says, the importance of a perspective that includes our eternal destination, keeping the commandments, avoiding bondage to addictions and false ideas, and balancing the inevitable flow of worldly values with a regular diet of spiritual nourishment. I repeated my usual message discouraging hanging out and encouraging dating activities that lead to marriage, much like rubbing your irritating beard on the face of a woman. That is a part of... Of those dating activities in my He said that? That was actually, yeah, that he had that struck from the record, but I got an insider copy. <laughs> Judy, will you read that back to me? Please strike that from the record. I, I would have loved to go to this. Even as a married man, I would have attended this just to observe, because why not? I think it would be super entertaining. Who doesn't love hearing Elder Oaks remind people, hey, guys, stop going and all the stuff I've never seen in real life, going and using the girls for food, take them on dates. I don't know. Yeah. I, and he took a picture yeah, with his wife where I swear, is he holding a remote? Did they set up an SO? Did he set up his little uh, Nikon on a tripod and he's standing there with his fob? Because if you look at that picture, it looks like he's just like, all right, honey, ready? He's just holding it. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that's true. So, guys, if you're single and a listener, and I know many of you are, don't hang out. Keep it real. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of hanging out is not such a bad thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Hanging what you're saying. out, hanging out, Jeff. No, well, not like I mean, I'm I'm happily dating a great woman right now. Tremendous. You woman. have to say that though. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But also, I feel like hanging out is. I mean, that's that's. The, so I I've been having a great debate on my Facebook feed this week uh, on an article. On an article talking about uh, we're in an age of loneliness hmm. and how this loneliness is actually like a very very harmful thing. And as a society, we're oh, moving yeah. away from that yeah. because we're, we we favor so much the uh, the lone wolf, the guy that you know you're you're a solo entrepreneur, you're making it on your own, you're doing it, you're just you know you're not waiting for anybody else, you're just sucking it up and going after it. And so we value that sort of isolationism and uh, and. It becomes a dangerous thing because we need the synapses that that occur with as we interact with other people. Well, so I I think I think I mean some of the debate is has been directed at at the reason for that is just like 
technology, uh, social media, all these sort of surface level connections that we have that don't go any deeper. And so I like as I as I look around at uh, at people today, I mean, there's a big part of me that's like, you don't have the skills required to go and just date. You can't just jump in there and go be successful dating. Like you're you're too awkward, nervous, shy, whatever it is, uh, not good with people, uh, and and so you need the the safety net that is like sort of a, a social context, a a very easy hey, we should hang out, we should get going on this, uh, because we're all I mean you you fear rejection or failure or. Uh, or even letting down your own walls. And so there's an easy way to transition in. That being said, Elder Oaks, I'm sure, sees it as something else. I just, What I'm suggesting is I don't think hanging out means what he thinks it means. It sounds like you're questioning the teaching of an apostle. That's what I'm getting No, I'm just, I, like, I, I don't question, I just feel like his verbiage is, uh, he's, he's trying to use, like, the like what the hip modern kids would say. And that's not what the hip modern kids say. He's he's speaking like a grandpa, uh, you know. It's it's trying to describe how the kids are smoking the weed. What you're saying is if he no, got if, it, if he got up there and said, "Stop hooking up with people from Tinder," you'd all perk up yeah. and be like, "He's speaking my language." That I feel like that's more the intent that he's trying to get at is like is like, "Hey, is, this this casual making out or or uh, you know like getting Nick into Mo. frivolous relationships that are that have no meaning and are really like killing your soul that's the danger, but maybe maybe he's not maybe he is absolutely set on like you guys are too friendly in groups. Well, I do think I going to dinner with more than one person. Well, not only that, cause I think a lot of guys stink at pulling the trigger. I mean, they really do. I I I know it's because culturally we put so much pressure on marriage that I think guys feel a lot of pressure to just. And going up to a girl and saying, "Hi, I'd like to go out with you," because you're so worried that it, it means everyone's. They think every, it means they're getting. Everyone's married, running yeah. till yeah three months later when you're supposed to be engaged, and we can't just be chill about it. I think that's one of the problems where if we're able to bring not a hanging out mentality, but to remember that just dating is a casual thing where you are doing activities that are constructive towards marriage, but you also don't need to freak out. It's like that service I used to see advertised in Sky Mall called It's Just Lunch for Busy Professionals. Guys, <laughs> it's just lunch. <laughs> just go to lunch. That's all you got to do. And if it sucks, That's all it is. it's over. That's all it is. We could do a whole episode on how sad I am that Sky Mall might be disappearing. When <laughs> I'm terrible. When John DeLynn announced this stuff a couple of weeks ago and the Sky Mall news hit, I wanted to make my own little Facebook picture that said, I stand with Sky Mall. Because that is where I feel my true allegiances lie. What, You're a savage. What am I going to do on my on my flights if I can't look at Sky Mall? Delta's magazine is half in Spanish now. I mean, I speak it, but it's just the same content that's in English. It's not... You just read it in English. Absolutely. That's terrible. Um, one of our last items here. I want to read this book. There is a book here by a fine fella named Avi Steinberg um, called... I'm missing the name right here. The Lost Book of Mormon. And so... He's a, a non-believer in LDS, but in, in the church or anything, but he's fascinated by it. And he loves, he, he loves understanding the history of the Book of Mormon, not just what the book contains itself, but how it came into being. And it's uh, basically, as I can understand it, a, a, a serious and not necessarily believing look, but not an antagonistic overview of the Book of Mormon sort of perceived as great Amer a great American novel, like a priceless artifact from old weird America during that period of the mid 19th century, you know, a very American product, like it says here, like jazz or superhero comics or whatever else. And it, and it just goes into all this stuff. It seems like an interesting study. I'd actually be interested to read this book and see how it, uh, how it all plays I out. I read it. Yeah. Cause it seems pretty cool. I mean, he even dissects how Mormons get really excited, like going on pilgrimages to Guatemala and seeing things in pyramids or, or, or specific writings that they believe translate to like the, the saying, and it came to pass, which is used, which is overused in the Book of Mormon. You know, all these things we do to substantiate the historicity of the Book of Mormon, uh, whether whether real historicity or stuff that we're just kind of trying to drum up to make ourselves feel better. Either way, I could I could appreciate this. It's almost like an anthropological examination of Mormon belief in the Book of Mormon and the book's uh, weight, just as a piece of 18th century Americana in that sense. So I think it could be interesting it look a little i'm i i'm hoping that it's 
nothing nothing to uh, detract. I don't. It doesn't. The church. It, and I don't think it, it is. It doesn't strike me as that. It strikes me more as kind of a pleasant like overview of it. Like, even the author says he's like he he loves Mormonism, thinks it's interesting to study. He's not looking to do a tear down or anything like that. So I think that could be a could be an interesting. I read. like it. And um, I will mention this, but I will not post to it. Someone posted on our wall. We'll love this one. It's an article that says, 40 LDS novels announced as Whitney Award finalists. And I said to myself, this is great. What are the Whitney Awards and why are Mormons doing so well at the Whitney Awards? That's terrific news. Turns out the Whitney Awards are awards given annually to novels by LDS authors only. <laughs> so... They got it. They made it. So, of course, all 40 of them, basically, it's that there's 40 categories, I'm guessing, and all of them are LDS. I don't know. And let's be honest, most Mormon novels are, are how you say, not, not great, not amazing. I've, uh, how, I've seen. How does one say, Jeff, what about Twilight? I wish. Jeff, what about Ender's Game? Ender's Game's a classic. What about Levin Thumps? Anybody? Eleven thumbs? Le- no, no. I Beyonders? Sure. Uh, I saw people swear by the work and the glory, which is not very well written, but that's okay. Gerald Lund, what a treat. An American treasure. <laughs> that trilogy of films. I believe we need to revisit a lot of Mormon cinema and write film reviews of all these classic Mormon films. That- <laughs> I know we really want to. Unfortunately, they're all only on VHS and you can't get them on anything that'll play today. Not even you can't even stream some of them on Amazon or anything? Paid? No, there's a lot of them that just won't, except for like Saturday's Warrior that I found on YouTube the other day. Also, I did find the Book of Mormon movie in its entirety on YouTube, and there's there was discussion weeks ago that we should just like put it up on a hangout or something, and all of us could sit around. As we'll it, plan it ahead. We'll plan we'll it ahead, it but I'm it's not Valentine's Day. No, no, no. But I'm down with this if you are, Al. I'm down with streaming it and having our twin family join us while we just laugh. I'd watch it. We can Mystery Science three thousand it. Let's let's go. I'm down. So. uh yeah, we'll plan that. I don't know. Uh, let us know, everybody. Let us know what nights are good for you, okay? And we'll let me tell you the way you're going to let us know. You need to visit thisweekinmormons.com yep. and leave a comment on this episode. That, or That's the way. That's the only way. Or you can email us, contact at This Week in Mormons, which several of you have done this week. It's been delightful. Thanks for the articles, the mentions, the uh, the comments. Yeah. And what we're not going to do is uh, you know use one of those services that, gives everyone scheduling options and how we're going to, that's not going to happen guys. We're not going to put that out there. So you just have to take, no. the, you have to take the initiative or it's not going to happen. Yes. But also you can join us on our various social media outlets on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Google plus or uh, YouTube. Even we, we love all of our listeners wherever you may be and appreciate you spending the time with us as we uh, ramble on in what really is an exercise in our own vanity, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> We do good stuff. I, I, anyway, Jeff. I'm peace with it. Thanks for the week, man. It's good to talk to you. And you. And all of you folks, you also have a wonderful week. And uh, I will just say, if you've had a rough week because of John Delin, it's going to be okay. Just hang in there and don't leave us, okay? Stay stay with the family. I would appreciate that. That's all. Another episode of This Week in Mormons is gone. of this moment is so clear and as certain as the rising of the sun if your world is filled with darkness doubt and fear just hold on hold on the light will come everyone who ever try and feel stands much taller when the victory's won and those who've been in darkness for a while kneel much longer when the light has come it's a lesson every one of us must the answers never come without a fight And when it seems you've struggled for too long Just hold on